Welcome, everyone, to the Masculine Wilderness Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Perez, and I am uh, the founder and CEO of Epic Project. Today is really fun for me because I get to have a conversation and introduce all of you to my good friend, David Bennett, from the Kansas City area, who has been one of our longest-serving Epic volunteers, and he is, in my opinion, an actual anti-trafficking action hero, but he's not out busting down doors and beating up the bad guys. He's doing something really different. We've talked a little bit about it, but David, welcome. Tell us some of the things. We'll get into the nitty gritty of the work we've been doing together, but tell us some of the most important things about you that don't have anything to do with the work we're doing, and then we'll dive into that. All right. Thank you for the introduction, Tom. Something Interesting about me, it's hard to determine exactly what to say about me because I care so much about this work. You know, often people ask me, tell me something unique about you. And I tell them I'm involved in fighting against human trafficking, sexual exploitation. And the look they get is like, what? (laughs) You know, because it is definitely in my heart to do this work. Having a daughter that is 10 years old and being married for Mm. over 20 years now is what I love the most is I love being married and having a family and seeing my daughter grow. And the world that she has to face right now is really scary. And for me to be able to know what I know, to be able to guide her and help her really brings a great joy to me and to share my story and what I do with others. So they understand that this problem is not your, as we always say, your Hollywood episode. It's not always the van pulling up and kidnapping people. It's not all about small children being abducted and sexually exploited. You know, it's about real people and they just, oh, okay. And it really opens up pathways for a conversation and I could talk about it for a long time. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you're not a cop or a politician or a, well, you're kind of a minor celebrity, (laughs) at least in our circles, but like, you're just a guy. Tell us about like your work. You've been working for the same company forever. Yeah in the primarily in Kansas City area, yeah. right? So I work for a convenience store chain called Quick Trip. I've been there for 28 years. And for me, knowing what I know now about human trafficking and the signs of it, I wish I would have known what I know now 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Just because, yeah. you know, I see the late night runs for women coming in and mm-hmm. getting their energy drinks and their food at midnight and looking to go wow. out. But I thought, you know, to go clubbing, but more than likely they were probably being trafficked. And since I've yeah. gotten involved, I have been able to use my knowledge of what I've learned to talk to women who I've suspected of being trafficked and making sure they're safe. And it's I've done it three times and it's gone overall pretty well. Wow. One time was slightly scary, wow. but you know, I kind of trusted God with letting this individual have my phone to contact a ride. And it worked out, <laughs> wow. but it was definitely a very obvious situation that I was aware of. And I was able to help that yeah. young lady get some food and some drink and make sure she got into her car okay that she was getting a ride for, even though I didn't exactly agree with who she getting the ride with, but to make sure she yeah. was safe. So because of that, you know, talking to Jessica Bender, when we were up in Portland, I'd asked her, you know, mm-hmm. what do I say to a young lady who I think is being trafficked at work? And she goes, all you need to do is say, are you safe? And Mm. so I've used that many times. And well, three times, I wouldn't say many, but are you safe? And they really, they kind of look at you like, why are you asking me this? But it definitely catches their attention. So I'm very thankful for that and what she told me to to ask. What I love about that story and that that image that conjures up is you are, and I don't say this in a, like a diminishing way, but you're just a guy in the community, like so many other guys. And you're in that moment, you show up in those places and you have the knowledge of what's going on. And I think it, it helps. That's why I'm always, I've always been such a fan of you because you represent the potential of so many men, you know, a lot of guys are like you, like me, we think, well, I, there's nothing I can do. And you kind of blow that theory right out of the water. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, it. you're, you represent, I think in so many ways, it's so many of our guys actually, like the potency of male allies in this yeah, work. Absolutely. Like you, you bring something really unique. So I, I appreciate that. So you said your daughter's 10 yes. now. How old was she when you started with Epic? Oh, man. So this kind of goes back, just a real quick background of of my church. We are very 
much involved in you know, raising money for human trafficking. We're in year 15 of our fundraiser for Run to Stop It, and we hope to eclipse $3 million this year total for wow. 15 years. That goes all directly out to human trafficking organizations like Exodus Cry and a local house here that we support and donate stuff to. And I bring that up because seven years ago, I just kind of got made aware of it more. Maybe I heard it before, but was more in tune. And I end up watching the movie Nefarious from Mm Exodus Cry. And I'm watching it. They're one of their first ones. One of their first ones, yeah. And it it had been out for a while. And I remember sitting on my couch and watching it by myself. And I was just in total shock. And I didn't know anything about it Mm -hmm. until our pastor brought it up. And I'm watching this movie. And at the very end, I might get emotional here because it really broke me. The young girl that got... um, abducted and bought. She was like five years old and they showed the picture of her dress that had stained and, you know, had blood on it. And it absolutely yeah. ripped me apart knowing that I had a daughter that was three at the time that I could not just sit mm-hmm. on the, the sidelines and do nothing. Yeah. And then shortly after that, Excess Cry reached out to you, who <laughs> reached out to... That's that. right. You were in... Were you in that first I was in the meeting first meeting. Yeah. yeah. So... That's right. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you had come to Kansas City and made a case yeah. at Exodus Cry, and I was there with a, a pastor wow. and two other guys. One of those men is still on my team to this date. And, you know, we were doing the training uh, with Justin, and that day, the pastor I was there with, he's like, this is all you. And it kind of confirmed wow. what I heard. Probably about a year before, I was sitting at my dining room table, and I heard, you know, the visual voice of God say, I'm going to use you to help men. And mm-hmm. I didn't know what that meant at the time, but it was very clear. And I was like, you can't use me, not with my story, not with my, you know, past addictions. There's no way. And here we are now, seven years later, helping men, trying to call men out to be better men and how they talk with people and talk with friends and talk to women. And, you know, I'm very observant and I've been gifted with the, the gift of empathy, which really helps me connect with men or, you know, on the patrols. But we can go into more detail with that yeah. later. But I'm very thankful. Yeah. I think it's fascinating that you would have that sense that you hear God saying, I'm going to use you to help men Mm -hmm. in response to the exploitation of women. So it's not, I'm going to, I've called you to to rescue women. You said, no, I've called you to serve men. That's a really important distinction. So I will come back to the the experience with the patrols themselves. And I want to circle back to the church as well, but... So you started this when your daughter was three. So you have been working with Epic seven years. Yes. Yeah. So you're raising a daughter knowing what seeing what you've seen. Yes. How is that for you? How have you learned to process the stuff? Because you've seen stuff, you've heard Mm -hmm. stuff. Like, how has that been for you? And what role has your wife played in helping you navigate that? Well, you know, I can remember back to my very first patrol. I know we're going to get back to patrol, but this is very big in yeah. my, just in how I, the way I am and the support that my wife gets, gives me. I yeah. had done the patrol and I'd gotten home and I'd come to the patrol late and she stayed up for me because she knew it was the first one. And Tom, I couldn't even like look at her or talk to her because I felt dirty. Mm-hmm. I felt like mm-hmm. I, I couldn't have a conversation without, you know, because of what I just experienced. You know, and to say a little, say just a little bit about what you experienced. Um, so just, that some people might not know. So during the patrol, like during just the rawness of the messages that we received, the language, the request, the pictures that were sent, mm-hmm. you know, just those types of items just were ingrained in my head, you know, after the first night. Yeah. And it was just, and she knew I was kind of bothered by that, but she supported me. And because of that experience, I then at the time called a meeting for all the wives to come with their husbands that were doing the patrols and just kind of went over Mm kind of what we were doing, what it looked like. So they knew what was going on. So they had a better understanding, yeah. like, what are you going to go do? You're going to go do what, you know? <laughs> yeah. And like, we can like circle back to the patrols later, but I wanted them to have a good understanding of what, why we were coming together. And this was seven years ago and doing the yeah. back page patrols and, you know, just so they understood right. kind of why they might be off because I was off, you know? Right, right. <laughs> it was one of those things. Ooh, so go ahead. 
Yeah. So for folks who don't know what we're in detail, what we're talking about, the patrols is the intervention program that Epic's been doing now for 11 years. Dave was one of the first generation of volunteers that started doing this. A patrol is a team of guys with dedicated hardware and software in a secure location, posting fake ads online, selling sex and interrupting active online sex buyers. And this is a an ecosystem that is responsible for a huge proportion of actual sex trafficking. So we are basically inserting ourselves into that transaction. So you were, you had posted ads and buyers were responding. Yes. What was the conversation with your wife that night? How did you explain that to her? I honestly, I didn't even know what to say. I mean, we both knew that I was bothered by it and she didn't press too much. And I eventually did talk to her kind of about, you know, what I saw, what I did, you know, but because of that, you know, and I tell all my guys, if it's their first patrol there, I, I give them that warning. And then now I'm yeah. able to, like, you know, I tell my guys, I'm able to turn it on and turn it off, you know, because I have yeah. to. Yeah. And about kind of circling back to the question with my daughter, just yeah. last week, literally, we have gotten her phone and I got lots of stuff on there to protect her. I know there's still ways that, you know, predators can get to her. There's things that she still may not see. Yeah. And so she's 10 and she had responded to an unknown number and had mm. given her name. And I had to get my, not anger, but my worry out of me. And I had to talk to her and say, yeah. hey, you know, you cannot be doing this. And if it's a number you don't know, you don't respond. And she kind of looked at me and she's like, okay, you know, I'm really sorry about that. And so for me, it's the first time I've, I check her phone regularly and she's not on it very much. We yeah. usually have it for her. She used to call us if she's at home for a little bit. But because of what I've learned from doing these patrols, I was able to kind of guide her in a way to say, hey, this yeah. is to protect you. It's to protect mom. It's to protect our family. You know, you cannot be giving out this information uh, of who you are. And so that was kind of the first real life in my house scenario. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> It is. Yeah, there's like a, it's now bled over. It's not just something you do as a volunteer. It's actually yes. you're dealing with it in your own home. And I know that's a very common experience yeah. for so many people. My kids are grown and gone, so it's it, I don't have to deal with it in real time like mm -hmm. you do, except that I have a nine-year-old grandson and a yeah. six-year-old granddaughter. So I'm only one step removed from it. And it, yeah, some days it's scares me to death. I, yeah, yeah, but imagine. it's given me the opportunity to talk with friends of ours that have kids and have devices, yeah. you know, and I've talked with my nephew. He's 14 and a freshman in high school and just his access to pornography and what that can do yeah. to him because of this work. I don't go into a lot of detail of what I do, but because I know what I know, I'm able to have educational conversations with those yeah. that I choose to, that I feel need to have a talking to. And you know, yeah. the scary part is some of their responses like, oh yeah, you know, that won't happen to my kid. I'm like, eh, yeah, don't say right. that. <laughs> I know we're kind of getting to the part of the grooming, but that's all a part of the work that we do. Yes. And it leads yeah. to, I think, why we get on the phone with young men that, you know, we, we intercept a call and the kid is 19 years old and he goes, I'm 19 years old on a Friday night and I'm lonely. Yeah. And then he goes on to say, are my friend or my mom and dad going to find out? You know, what do you say to that kid? Like that night absolutely like broke my heart because what do you say to a 19 year old? who's lonely and worried about his mom and dad right now, yeah. you know? So at that point, you kind of got to go into dad mode and just do the yep. best that you can to explain that there's better things for, for him to be doing and to find a group of friends to what's the interest in too. And that's the beauty of patrols that we get the opportunity when it's given to talk to young people yep. or to anybody in all honesty. Well, it's, it's like you showing up behind the counter those times mm -hmm. when you saw a, a woman that was trafficked, you showed up in this guy's life uh, to speak truth yeah. and empathy and all yeah. of that. That's such a powerful picture in my mind. I, I want to go back, if you can remember, yeah. like what was it like the first time you answered a call from an active sex buyer? Do you remember that? I was extremely nervous. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure what to say. I totally I'm kind of copy off time what he said in his podcast about when I first yeah. got on the sheet, we thought all these guys were scum or just yeah. troublemakers, yeah. lawbreakers, like, you know, whatever, you name the thing that's bad. And we thought yeah. that's what they were. But in reality, 
It's 19 year old young men. It's four year old young men who just got out of a marriage that didn't work out when they got married at 21 and their wife broke yeah. their heart and he's searching for that love again and they're in the wrong places. Yeah. So and like what I yeah. tell my guys all the time is I absolutely hate that these men are calling to buy a woman. Yeah. But at the same time, yeah. I understand that there's a darkness or something in that man's life that's causing them to go down this path. And so what can we do to yeah. try to uncover that, to try to help them, to let them understand that, hey, we get you're going through a depression spell. We get you're going through a divorce. We get you're breaking up with your girlfriend over after five years or whatever the scenario may be. But we have the opportunity to let them know that this is not the way to go, that it, you know, destroy their life. Yeah. I think when Backpage got shut down and we decided to cold call guys, well, that was... <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, explain that, because yeah. these were guys that we had intercepted previously, right? Yeah, so during Backpage, just to kind of give a quick history here in Kansas City, we'd do a uh, three-hour patrol on a Tuesday, believe it or not, nine to midnight, um, and we would have 100 phone calls and messages in three hours. Wow. We had done a patrol on a Saturday or a Friday night, same time on back page of and we, the six of us were so busy and overwhelmed with calls and messaging, we like couldn't even keep track. I mean, my guys were like, oh my gosh, this is nuts. I'm like, yeah, this is what it is. So when back page got shut down, I think that was at, what's that, 2018? Eight, spring of 2018. I yeah, we were kind of put the patrols on hold and they're like, hey, let's call the guys that we had phone numbers from. And so I, you know, I got my patrol together. I told them guys, hey, we're just going to randomly call guys. And they were just like, what are we doing here? So you play, you're playing offense instead <laughs> playing of defense offense. all yeah. of a sudden. Right? Yeah, and that was not a scary time, but a very uncertain time because we had to be very careful. You know, we didn't want to call someone and that the wife answer or a female mm -hmm. and we say, hey, by the way, your husband is messing around. We didn't want to throw a grenade into that situation. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I did tell my guys, I remember just to say, if it won't answer, just say, I'm sorry, I have the wrong number because we don't want to yeah. get to that point where we're bringing up something that is really none of our business between them. And so that was one thing I was told my guys to be very careful of. But we got yeah. through a few guys, but the, the Wonderful part about that is because of that process, when I went to Miami for the Super Bowl, we were able to do a similar thing where we had phone calls that just had posted a bunch of ads and we had their phone numbers and we were able to call guys during the Super Bowl week in Miami. And we were able to have some breakthrough with some of those guys. Yeah. When we got hung up on and yelled at and, oh, I didn't call, but we have a call of six times at two in the morning or whatever. But we were able to really connect. So it was a different scenario than the back page days, but it, it worked yeah. for that yeah. time. So that was pretty amazing. And you're not, just to be clear, you guys aren't using your own personal no. phones to no. call these Absolutely. guys back. We have, a yeah, we have, a we platform. have an online platform. Yes. <laughs> wow. Tell me a little bit about like your guys. You talk to them so fondly. Like, are they guys like you? Oh. Like who, who are you? Oh, yeah. You know? I had a, actually, I've had two guys that one is still currently on my team and one has, <clears throat> excuse me, moved on. But they both had been recovering pornography addictions. And oh, yeah. doing this work enabled them to find some freedom, to find some like help from the guys at the table that were doing the patrol and being able to talk to other men that were obviously going a step further than they were, but it was some healing for them. And to mm -hmm. me, that was an amazing thing. They're your everyday worker, just like myself. I did have a law enforcement person on my team, but he never brought up his law enforcement piece. He was yeah, just able yeah. to, you know, talk to them in, in a way that I couldn't really communicate because we all have different ways, different styles of communication. I'm curious, why do you think for guys that struggling with a porn addiction, why is this kind of work redemptive for them? I mean, that's a good question, Tom. I think it gives them a sense of like, they can be healed, that there's guys that care. Mm. There's men that care about yeah. them, that they're not alone, that they're not yeah. uh, going down this road by themselves. Because I think as men, we feel very isolated when we get into bad patterns. And, you know, yeah. I think I love Epic had put on the Instagram page, it said, lonely men, the unspoken pandemic mm -hmm. or, or something like that. And I absolutely love that because that's so true because men 
don't get together and talk about heart issues. They don't get together and talk about how their marriage, they don't get together and say, man, I'm struggling here. And so Epic it enables us to have those conversations around a table and hold each other accountable and pray for one another and say, hey, check in on you. Hey, how'd you do this week with your wife? I knew you guys were going through a time. And so I think that is why men who are struggling with that addiction come into that realm of doing patrols where they see, okay, I'm not alone. Men do care. I do have a group around me, a circle around me that does care for my goodness. And they're able to use that to heal others and themselves. I think it just kind of happens. That's so beautifully ironic that you're doing this hard work Mm -hmm. and you guys are doing this as a team, but in the process of doing the work and trying to disrupt these attempts to Mm -hmm. buy sex, you're also building relationships and building each other up in the midst of that. That's something that I don't think most people realize. We, We see it all throughout our network. Have there been moments where you've like in the midst of a patrol where guys have been just really emotionally kind of hit hard by what they've seen or heard from, from buyers? Yeah, I had a individual who got on the phone with, it was another young man. I didn't hear his conversation because we had our head, headphones on and we were talking and yeah, he got done. And I could tell something was off. <laughs> I just was like, yeah. man, what's, you know, going out the end of every patrol, I always check my guys, make sure everything is good, that they're okay. And he's like, man, I'm going to need some prayer and somebody to talk to because he has two young sons. And he mm-hmm. got to the point where he was talking with this young man and couldn't find the words because he felt as if he was talking to his own kids and didn't know how to talk to him wow. about such a serious issue. So for him, yeah. I just talked him through it. And I obviously I prayed over him that to give him words and to know that that's okay, that we may not always have the words to say. Yeah. He's, he got through it and got over it and was able to kind of do some soul searching, was able to, to come back. And he long time on my team and just has moved away and isn't part of the team anymore. It was very impactful yeah. for him because he was able to share, hey man, I'm, I struggle with this. That was tough. Yeah. And we were like, yeah. all right, man, what can we do for you? And you know, just having that, that brotherhood, that, that time together just strengthened him to know that, hey, again, he's not alone in this. Like, I think that's the biggest thing. Like with men, we have so much pride. We have so much ego that we don't want to yeah. talk about our struggles. We don't want to talk about what's really bothering us. But if you have other men around you that are talking about it, then we open up. And I think that's where the healing yeah. starts and how you know we can change the world is by just changing yeah. the hearts of man. And I think that's the biggest objective that I love is my team, but then able to share that with strangers calling yeah. to buy. Um, yeah, that's such a potent yeah. thing. Are all your guys or have all of your guys come like you from a church background or are there guys that, that don't have any connection there but are still engaged um, with you doing yeah, this Yeah, all work? of them have come from a, a church background yeah. because our church is so into running, raising money for human trafficking. They're yeah. kind of not easy to pick <laughs> for them to be able to do more than just sign a check over and say, here you go, but for them to actually do something right. tangible where they're with other men that we get to make an impact with boots on the ground, I think has been super, super helpful. Yeah, yeah. I think like what the, what you're describing as a really, it's a community of healthy men Mm -hmm. or men trying to help each other be healthier. It's, that's a trend throughout our network Mm -hmm. of guys. And it's, and a lot of them come from like, like you and I come from a church background, but a lot of them don't. And it's the, but the same thing is happening. And like, there's, we're trying to break down those, those walls of loneliness Mm -hmm. that, can isolate us. I hear you tell the story and you're younger than I am. And I like, I, it's so ingrained in me that just men do, we go at all our, on our own Mm -hmm. and we don't need anybody. And for me at this point in my life, there's so much muscle memory that makes me do that. It's just what I've done my whole life. But I have more and more moments now as I've gotten older where I'm just like, I'm really tired of try to be that guy. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't have men around me that are calling something better out of me, which is what you're doing with your guys, Ty's doing with his guys all over the country. Like if I didn't have that, I I don't know what I'd do. Just get old and crusty. (laughs) That's the alternative, right? right? You just get old, isolated and crusty. Do you, do you have any experiences in the patrols that were just like, holy cow, this guy really gets it, like where your message 
and your approach to these buyers really was like got through? Or mm-hmm. Have there been moments? Yeah, I, I could, I'll share two that really stick out uh, for me. One of the biggest things that I encourage my guys to do is when they get a buyer texting or on the phone, I make them question the buyer and say, hey, we, how would you feel if somebody was buying your sister, your mother, your niece? And they all say, I would absolutely hate that. And then we respond with, well, that's what you're doing. You're buying somebody's. And for them, it puts life to what they're doing. Like, oh, Mm -hmm. we're not just a commodity. I can just go out and buy that. That's a real person. And that's a real person that has a heart and soul that is somebody's loved one or whatever. So that really, I always have them do that. And it changes the dynamic of the conversation if we can get that piece in there because it makes them kind of sit back and realize, okay, what's this guy talking about? At that point, I think they realize (laughs) we really are there to talk to them and not try to bring them down, talk them down. We had to shame shame them. them Exactly. One story I'd love to share that has probably been the most impactful for me is I had got on the phone with a buyer. This is post back page, but still a little while ago. And I'll never forget him. And his name is Joseph, but he went by Joey when he was buying. I got on the phone with him and we're talking. And then just to be clear, we don't you know, bring church and religion into the conversation. That's not our goal. But if you feel yeah. that opportunity is there, then we definitely use that to our advantage if we can. And so I'm talking to this gentleman and he says, or ask him, sir, do you, do you believe in God? Do you know Jesus? The reason I asked is because he said his daughter was homeschooled. I'd figured that out throughout the conversation. Mm-hmm. They were being homeschooled. So I just associated that with being believers. That's, that's <laughs> a pretty, pretty, yeah, natural, pretty natural connection. Yeah, connection. Sure. He's, like, sure. he's like, well, how'd you know that? Or he goes, how did I know you're going to hit me right in the face with that? And I'm like, I'm just asking, man. And he's like, yeah, I am. And I said, do you mind if I pray for you? over the situation. He was like, what? I go, yeah, let me, can I pray for you? And he was like, okay. And I'm praying for this guy and I start hearing him crying, like just crocodile tears. Like can't Mm -hmm. hardly catch his breath. Like, and I got done with the prayer and he's like, man, thank you so much. I goes, I'm going to get help. And I had said, can I call you back using our platform in a week to see how you're doing? And he's like, yes, you can. So that was a Friday. Then I come, then Sunday I go to church and during this worship song, I'm praying for Joseph, just praying for him, like just during worship, just hardcore, just all about him. And then I talked to him on Thursday that week. And so we've been playing kind of text tag throughout the week. And he goes, sorry, I've been busy. He goes, Sunday at this time, he told me it was the time I was doing worship. He goes, I sat down with my sponsor, which means he had been an addict or something before. Oh, so wow. he was having lunch okay. at the time. I was just praying for him. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And I shared this yeah. with him. He's like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. And I go, how are you doing? He goes, I'm doing really good. I've talked to my wife already about me playing around on business trips. And I oh. thought I'd always go on these business trips to make myself look good to the company. He goes, but I realized after talking to you, talking to my sponsor, that it was so I could mess around and treat myself. And wow. I, he goes, so moving forward, if I do have to travel because my daughter is homeschool, I'm going to take my wife and daughter with me. And while I'm in meetings, they can go whatever around the town and make it a, a family deal to where yeah. it kind of holds me accountable. And he had credit cards that he had hidden, and, but he only did it when he traveled. And so for wow. that, that follow up for him to come to that realization. And he's like, I really appreciate you talking to me and making me realize some things I was not being very aware or very conscious of. We'll be right back after these messages. Did you know we have a new show? Join us in listening to Shop Talk, an extension of the Masculine Wilderness podcast, where your host, Tom Perez, and me, your producer, Lauren Trantham, get together to talk about the behind the scenes action that goes on within the anti-trafficking movement, current events, and epic news. It's free to subscribe. Just head on over to our website at epicproject.org and sign up for our newsletter and you will be automatically opted in to receive these private episodes. See you at Shop Talk. And now back to the show. There's a beautiful pattern here of how you show up in people's lives. And like in this case, 
through the patrols, showed up, you exposed, just by being there mm-hmm. and being empathetic, really, yeah. said you helped him uh, and exposed so mm-hmm. many of these secrets that he had been carrying. Yeah. That is a, that's such a delicate and significant, like, trust mm-hmm. that you built with him. Why do you think that happened? Tell him, I, I don't know, just, I don't know, maybe not shaming him in the moment, not mm. telling him he was a terrible person in the moment, not calling yeah. him stupid. Why would you do that? Just all the things we would want to do right. like in the moment. Right. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Like all of, but just yeah. all the impulses, yeah, but just trying to hear him out and like let him talk to you so you can try to figure out what can I maybe say to maybe help him or give him some seed of hope. Yeah. And so that, yeah. For me, and that doesn't happen all the time. Trust me, I wish that it did. But those times that come up, they really do. Yeah. Just I'll share two more with you. Yeah. Another one was I was talking to a gentleman on he was texting on the platform of our patrol, and he said, I will call you when my wife falls asleep. And so he, he texted mm-hmm. me that. And so for me, my wife and I were pretty we're marriage leaders. We've done marriage counseling with other couples before we've helped other couples and so that yeah. for me busted me up and I was so angry. I was so mad that here's yeah. this guy <laughs> texting, I'm gonna call you. This is my wife falls asleep. Yeah. Thinking thinking you're a woman Correct. who's gonna hook Correct. up with. So I told my guys I had to step away because I, I was very angry. I was like, I cannot believe this guy. Are you kidding me? And I went down and kind of had some alone time and I went back up to the room where we were doing the patrol. And I said, Did he call? And they're like, No, he didn't. And I was like, Good. I didn't want to talk to him anyway. And yeah, then driving yeah. home, I kind of heard a small set of voices that said, David, you are the one to talk to that guy because of where your marriage is at, because of what you've been through. You need to take mm-hmm. those calls. And so for me, it kind of was like, all right, okay. And now yeah. I thrive. I hope somebody calls me that's married and having, because something is wrong in that marriage. Something is wrong in, in that marriage, but something is wrong in that house. What can I say to give them hope, to give them some gleamer of hope that it can get better, you know? So now it goes from, I don't want to talk to them. Now that's, I hope to talk to them. If I had figured yeah. that out because we have an opportunity to really share how special their marriage can be. But we yeah. understand yeah. there's issues that lead to them being unfaithful to doing things they shouldn't be yeah. doing. But I can't judge them for that. I only can be there as a brother and help them through it and guide them through it and give them some kind of opportunity to get better. So that's... Yeah. I think it highlights the like the stories like that. And I've heard a lot of stories like that. It, it highlights, again, the that this is unique work for men to do, mm-hmm. for men to engage with other men. And it is such a powerful thing. But you've mentioned loneliness as a, a common experience among men. And then you mentioned the second one that is a very common experience among men, and that is anger. Mm -hmm. In in response to what we're experiencing, what have you learned in doing this now for seven years? Like, what have you learned about anger? Like, what role does that play in all of this, if any? Um, Personally or from the buyer self? I think personally, okay. like your response of okay. anger, because it's certainly understandable. <laughs> right, yeah. But it's not necessarily always helpful. So like, what have you learned? The biggest thing that's helped me is going to Miami and doing the Super Bowl outreach and mm-hmm. going and talking to people face-to-face. And what I learned from that is I have no right to judge that person with what their catalyst was that they chose to use. I, I cannot... Mm-hmm be the judge of that. What what I can do is I can be a light. I can be hope. I can be somebody who will treat them with dignity and respect and hopefully get them on a better path. For me, that has given me the opportunity when I do start feeling that, and I kind of reflect like, David, this is your time to show them light and love and goodness and hope. You cannot show them, you know, you cannot show them anger. You cannot, you have to be and meet them in their darkest moment. Like that was the big thing in Miami. That was the biggest thing that was preached there is like these people are in dark places and they are going through yeah. things that they maybe were controlled control of most of the time, probably are not. They're learned behaviors. But what can we do to help them, to guide them without bringing shame? Because the last thing you want to feel 
if you're going through a lonely spell or feeling broken is, oh, here's more shame. Let me dump more on, on myself. Yeah. What happens when we dump shame? They tend to shut down and then they will over, they'll over react and do something and even worse, I guess would be, yeah. they would act out in a different they way. Kind of double down yeah. on it. Well, it's, it sounds so counterintuitive because we're talking about what you're talking about right now is how we talk to buyers. And like you're talking about extending empathy to them, mm -hmm. treating them with dignity as human beings. Like I can appreciate if someone listening to this hears you and go, man, that's just crazy talk. <laughs> Yeah. What do you say to people who say they don't deserve that kind of treatment? What do you say to them? I would, I fire back. I've done this. I said, have you ever felt lonely? Yes. Have you ever felt depressed? Yes. Have you ever acted out in a way you shouldn't have because of those? Yes. I go, well, this is that guy acting mm -hmm. out in a way that's different than you, but it's still acting wow. out in a way that's not okay. I go, yeah. we've all, yeah. we're not all perfect people and have, the greatest, like we go through things and we all react and do things different to cover that up, to cushion that. You know, this is no different. Like I you know, said before, I hate the fact that they're calling for this. At the same time, I can yeah. understand why they're turning this based on their trauma, based on their situation they're in right now in their life. Like, so yeah. I have to come alongside them and not beat them up like we say the baseball bat theory <laughs> we can't right. but to be clear the consequences yes. of their choices in that like those are severe yes. and they're real mm -hmm. and they're wrong and we don't pull any punches there right. yeah um but yeah it, it's such i think throughout the history of this particular intervention that we've been doing now for more than a decade one of the things that continues to surprise me is the support we've received from the survivor community for doing this very thing mm -hmm. with buyers over and over again. And you may have heard similar messages, but I, what I've heard from survivors is this is our work as men to do. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity. And I know your heart, I know others have said similar things like it's a privilege to be able to show up in that moment and speak this kind of empathetic truth. We're not, it's not that we're not holding them accountable, right? but we're holding them accountable to, to become a better version of themselves. Correct. And that comes at a cost and there are consequences for their decisions and all of that. Yeah. One thing I love about Texas right now and the law that they have, if they're caught yeah. buying sex, it's a felony, right? So when we it's get those felony. conversations yeah. and I see they're from Texas, I had a guy two, three patrols ago, and I told him that because I knew he was from Texas and he had somehow yeah. in the conversation, he had mentioned that his dad was in the hospital and wasn't doing well, which is one of the reasons why he called. And I was like, yeah. and, I, and I told him, I go, sir, I understand that. I don't have my dad anymore. I don't have my mom anymore. I go, and if you get yeah. arrested and put in jail because of this choice tonight or a future choice, you're not going to be able to be there for them. You're going to miss these times. Yeah. And he literally started crying because he didn't put yeah. that into consideration. He's like, and he yeah. literally said, I didn't even think about that because he's taking yeah. care of his dad. I go, if you're not there because of this choice, yeah, who's, who's going to take, take care, care of, him? of him? If you love your yeah. dad that much, you're going to hospital and you're taking care. I know you do. You can't do that from behind bars. And I was just very yeah. blunt with him. And he goes, this will lead to jail. And he wow. just kind of sat back in the chair. I could not, I didn't see him. I could just feel him sulk like, yeah. oh, okay. But it, it, again, it's, we have to put justice. We have to put consequences in their scope or their, then what's the point if we don't? Right. We right. got to let them a, be aware of some things that could happen. And that's yeah, just yeah. kind of, you just kind of learn that. Again, I've been doing it for years. And you know, like you said, it's a privilege and an honor to be able to be light and to help men. Yeah in these times where they're feeling the worst that they can be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's still crazy talk, man. That's just so, yeah. so not like we always mm -hmm. were as men. I, I knew you're like this too. It's like, we're drawn to these action hero narratives yeah. when we, I get it. Cause I was raised on that yeah. too. Like the, the hero beating up the bad guy, bringing single-handedly bringing the hammer of justice. Right. And this is not that. Right. 
But it's even more powerful, I think, when you, when you really, if you zoom out and look at the big picture. Yeah. So you've come into this work and you've been sustained, I know, personally, spiritually, relationally, mm-hmm. you've been sustained by your church and encouraged by yeah. your church to do this. In my experience, in, in trying to engage churches, it, it isn't always like that. There isn't always a, a high degree of buy-in. Why is your church community different in that? Because they have, like you said, they have put their money where their mm-hmm. mouth is. What is it? And there are, to be clear, there are a ton of other communities, right. church communities that really do throw down serious resources and commitment to this work, but it's not universal among churches. But what makes your experience with your church special in that regard? Why have they been so impactful? I think uh, for me, even for our church, like when Epic came and we came to Exodus Cry to see or talk about it and having a pastor there and understanding that we have an opportunity to disrupt demand. And to my pastor, understand that if there's no demand, there won't be, there'll be less supply. And for him to really, like he didn't really grasp that concept until Epic came into the picture. I don't think, mm-hmm. and now that he knows, and I've been true and been doing it for seven years, when they tell me all the time, thank you for staying steady with this work. It's important. They know what I'm doing. And I think just them yeah. having an understanding of the demand side, because how many times, you know, I reach out to other churches like, oh, well, you know, we donate to this and they have a house and we help the women and the children. And, and I'm like, yeah, that's great. I love that. Like it's necessary. Yeah. But what are you doing for demand? And I hardly ever get a response because <laughs> like you're missing what we need to do. And that's why I love Epic and the work that we do and that we're privileged to do is because we get to address demand. We get to talk to yeah. men that are struggling with life, yeah. that are having issues that need help, that need support, that need to be accounted for as there's hope for me. There's, that there's yeah. others struggling just like I am. And yeah. I think... Our pastor's been to a couple of our patrols and he absolutely is just enthralled with what we do. He's like, wow, this is really great. So I think yeah, getting yeah. them involved and in seeing exactly what we're doing helps because it's really hard to explain what we do <laughs> via yeah. phone call. It's not something, <laughs> it's yeah, like, like my mom used to say, it's not something you talk about in polite. <laughs> exactly. Right? So I think that's yeah. important too. And the biggest thing, also thing that I've noticed when talking to people about coming and checking out patrol, the first thing they automatically jump to is, oh, I couldn't talk to anybody who wants to buy a child. And I'm like, hold on. Yeah. There's, it's not just children being bought. Yes, that happens. These yeah. are your everyday yeah. 17 year olds to, and up and, and even younger that are being bought and sold multiple times a day that, well, how yeah. do you talk to them? I go, they're going through stuff. We need to be there for them to give yeah. them help, to give them hope. And after I talk to them for a little bit, they kind of come to a relationship like, okay, I will come check it out. But the first thing they jump to is, oh, I couldn't talk to a pedophile. I go, I yeah. couldn't either. That's only happened twice yeah. in seven years where it was definitely yeah. Yeah. obvious what they were looking for. And we have the proper channels that we go through when that comes to life. So yeah, you guys are, I don't know the, I've, there have been so many cities now, but like there's the police and the local law enforcement are aware of your mm-hmm. work in the community. Yeah, I had a- Yeah, and there are, there are protocols in place for those very Yeah, situations. like real quick here in Kansas City, I had three FBI agents come to one of my patrols just via contact. And they were like, this yeah. is incredible. Like they saw yeah. a whole other side of how to fight trafficking. <laughs> and then because of Epic and through connections, me and another guy got the opportunity to go to St. Charles uh, County here in Missouri, it's near St. Louis. And we were able to do a live operation with a police department there. And we wow. literally saw from 4 p.m. till 2 a.m. in the morning, we saw 16 buyers. And after the police wow. talked to them, they turned off the recording devices and they sat there and me and my Epic guy, talk to him like face to face, like, Hey man, what's so you're doing a lot. Yeah, like you had like, been doing on the what's phone. What's going on? Why are you doing this? Yeah. Well, I'm lonely and my wife just doesn't, doesn't do much for me when I go, have you, and I literally said, have you told her that? It's like, well, no, I go, why don't you try that wow. instead of going around her back and, and cheating on her? Why don't you tell her you need a certain touch that you want to do something specific and see what she says. And he was just like, oh, well, yeah, they want the easy button. 
instead of putting yeah. the work into yeah. it. And we reached all every buyer that you could imagine. Your high-end banker to your 19-year-old young kid that just liked to have sex, that just would wow. pay for it because he liked to do it. And yeah. it, it was an amazing time. And even the detective was like, I don't know how you do it. Like he was just couldn't believe like the things were asking them and just talking to him and kind of shed some light for him. Like, oh, I didn't think about why he's doing this or why yeah, yeah. he decided to act out in this moment. So when law enforcement gets to kind of see and experience what we do, it kind of lets them understand that, hey, we, we're in this for the good. We're not in this to pat ourselves on the back. Hey, look at us. We can be heroes too. <laughs> right. Perspective of, wow, that's genuine like concern and like care. Yeah. So that's one thing I love when we get those opportunities to, to do a live thing. And that's, that says so much about who you guys are that law enforcement will trust mm -hmm. you with that. Like, we, we, you guys have done that. I know similar things happening in, in with our teams in Texas and up here in Portland as well. And that's a, it's a testimony to the integrity of you guys and how you conduct yourself. That's one of the things when I speak and share about our work, I'm proudest to talk mm -hmm. about because we're not cops. Right. You know, we, we don't have a badge and a gun and we don't have any kind of mandate to, fight crime. <laughs> right. And yet that's yeah, yeah. right. I mean, and we certainly, well, I know myself, I don't know if you do this. We don't, we don't wear capes. You might wear capes. No, you know, no we're, cape not, <laughs> we're not action heroes, we're not superheroes, but such a powerful thing. I want to just make a couple more questions for you. One is when you're not doing this, obviously you're in mm -hmm. it. It's a part of kind of how you show up in the world. But what are the things that you do that are life-giving for you that kind of help you recharge and restore yourself because this work takes a toll. What's life-giving for you at this season of life? Um, for me, uh, just being able to hang out with my daughter and she's kind of mm -hmm. the reassuring thing that what I'm doing and why I'm doing it was for mm -hmm. generations that are her age in the future and for young kids that are her age growing up in this world now, just hanging with her really recharges me. I listen to uh, a lot of jazz music and I'll have, yeah, I'll really? have a cigar and <laughs> drink some bourbon and that's kind of relaxing for me. So that's recharging. And then my wife and I yeah. make it a point to go out and have a date night at least once a month. And we try to get away once or you. twice a year, just her and I without our daughter, just to kind of yeah. recharge ourselves, recharge our marriage. Because we've been married see 2000 or so 21 years spent together or get this 20, right i gotta get this right yeah, been married for 21 years together for 24 and that just recharges us and we both need recharging and for her for a while just kind of a little segue here she was a school nurse yeah. for the kansas missouri school mm -hmm. district which is a really it's not a great school district it's lots of poverty lots of yeah lots of a lot mother, of vulnerable yes, kids and so for a while there, she saw the same things that I was talking about. And so we were able to kind of yeah. pray over those kids and those people. And she was able to say, well, this is what my husband does. And they're, and every time she shares what I do, like when yeah. it comes up, they're like, what? They just don't understand. <laughs> they, don't, they don't get it. Yeah. It's like, what does yeah. he do again? Yeah. But then when you talk to people and you talk to, we were on a trip and we met this two other couples who were just all sitting around at this resort and I started kind of sharing what I do and they were just like, that is amazing. Wow. And for me, those wow. opportunities where you don't expect, not necessarily confirmation, but goodness from people about what you're doing really helps get those batteries recharged and, and to keep pushing on. Yeah. The biggest thing is just having the time with my daughter and just being with the family, just really recharged. I've recently gotten to pickleball, so that kind of, that, oh, there <laughs> it is. that's kind of fun. So good for you. Yeah, it's, that's been. So look, I want to loop yeah. back. Just give me the, the right up top of your head. Current favorite jazz is, who are you listening to? I'm going to go just old school. I like a uh, good old saxophone, just Dave Cause. <laughs> Okay. All right. And current preferred brand of cigar? Uh, right now I am on, what is it called? Oh gosh. Shoot. It's not, I can't think of the name of it, but I've been on a little tear. Uh, I'll go with, okay. I'll do a, a short little nub camera and I pretty much have those all the time. <laughs> That's a consistent okay. and one. And <laughs> then current favorite kind of go-to bourbon? Mixer or straight? 
Straight, straight. Okay, I'll go with, I'm just looking to half. Let's see, I went to Rick Cannon. No, I'm probably on a little Sazerac where I run right now. I've been enjoying that with an ice cube. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's yeah. great. All right, my, my last question, because we want to give you the last word on the day that your daughter graduates from high school. What is one thing that you hope is different in the world of men that she will encounter? Her and her friends. Um, I want her to encounter men to be respectful and to have that um, heart and be vulnerable and be able to talk more openly about things that are bothering them than what we do in this current state of mind and that it's okay. David Bennett, you are you are a real live epic action hero and you're a blessing and I'm so proud to just be in this with you. So thank you. Yep. Thank you, Tom, just for thinking of this years ago and doing all that you do behind the scenes and Justin and everybody that's involved at Epic. I mean, it's quite a amazing organization to be a part of and to volunteer for and to know that this is so important right now in this world and yeah. so necessary and that we need men to, to be different and to be better. And this gives great. us the opportunity to give that encouragement and to make men better as small as it may be at first to, like we always talk about the small circle and then it slowly expand out. One guy takes yeah. a piece of what we do to another group and then just continue that whole process. So I'm excited for the future. I'm excited for what it's gonna do. And most importantly, I'm just excited for how we can change man over the next few years. Yeah. Cause it ain't gonna happen tomorrow. It's I not gonna happen next year. Yeah. It's gonna take time and, and diligence and Epic has everything we need to be able to do that. I strongly believe yeah. that. I love the way you show up, dude. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for this opportunity. I, when I saw the podcast, yeah. and I was like, oh, I really want to get on that. <laughs> Here Just you because are. Yeah. I think it's important for more volunteers to share their experiences. As they may all be very similar, they're all still very unique yeah. in their own way. Yeah. And I think, and I think yeah. other... We will yeah. be doing... Yeah. Men need to hear it. We will be having more of them yeah. on. Yeah. yeah, I want people to hear more of these stories. Yeah. And Thanks, not to I like it. boast us or like, oh, look at us. Look, at, No, it's to show that we care and that we can change, that we can be vulnerable and open to helping others, even if we don't agree with their decisions. Yeah, yeah. So that's great. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Masculine Wilderness Podcast with your host, Tom Perez. This podcast is a production of Epic Project, a nonprofit organization dedicated to disrupting the demand for commercial sexual exploitation and dismantling the forces that perpetuate it. I'm your producer, Lauren Trantham. Special shout out to our favorite logo designer, Michelle Boucher, as well as Wes Finley, who crafted and donated our amazing theme song. Interested in sponsoring an episode? Send us an email at podcast at epicproject.org. That's podcast at E-P-I-K project.org. As a nonprofit organization, your donations allow us not only to produce this podcast and change the conversation around sexual exploitation, but also to manage our many programs, such as buyer intervention, teen prevention, and community education. Your support also allows us to support survivors of exploitation and more. To learn more about our work and to donate, visit www.epicproject.org. Once again, that is www.epikproject.org. Most importantly, this podcast would be nothing without you, the listener. Thank you for tuning in, subscribing, and sharing this episode with your friends and loved ones. Thank you for your commitment to learning more about the issues that affect our most vulnerable populations. Thank you for navigating this masculine wilderness with us. See you next episode.